There is a lot of buzz in the Indian retail space and it is not just thanks to the money shoppers across the country seem to be spending. After a long wait, it seems the big foreign retailers might be able to come into India after all. But is the move going to be a challenge or an opportunity for homegrown retailers? How is one of India's oldest apparel maker, Raymond's, dealing with it? To be sure, the company has already had its shares of hits and misses in the branding space. To understand the larger strategy, I caught up with the company's managing director, Gautam Singhania, and I began by asking him how the cost pressures and the volatility in the commodity prices were impacting his company. I think inflation is a concern issue which everybody knows is rising interest rates etc to try and curb the inflation. Having said that I think uh, c consumption is still happening. I think if you see on the grassroots level there is consumption. Uh, retail is doing well. So globally there is a slowdown as we can always already see but I still feel that India is uh, reasonably well protected against it and maybe we'll just get away. As somebody who is in the garments business, both in the fabric and the apparel business, uh, what has this volatility in input prices done to you, you know, in terms of your own businesses? Because it's very difficult to second guess what's going to happen in the commodity markets right now. Well, if you see over the last year, the commodity prices have had a big seesaw and it's obviously unsettling. Uh, it's really, if you're a strong brand, you're able to pass it on, but it really makes your forecasting that much more difficult. Uh, but it's something you have to live with. You can't fight it. Uh, you've seen prices go up 200% in commodity prices, whether it's cotton or wool or polyester, and then suddenly it comes down, you know, whether it's steel or cement. And mm. I think that's a reality that we've got to cope with. I think uh, we just have to understand that this volatility, this volatility is here to stay. And uh, it's we're going to cope with it the best, the guys who are going to, you know, sort of survive. Mm. In your case, you of course hiked prices because cotton prices were up. Now they've down about 50%. So, I mean, are you going to bring down prices? I mean, can you really trend with what's happening in the commodity markets? Because that, that could spoil your own micro market dynamics here. Yeah, it, it weighs havoc with the MRPs because, uh, you know, cotton prices go up. There's a lag before you can put the prices up. Sure. There's an excise duty. There are goods up there. So, obviously, it creates a lot of havoc. Uh, one has to find a balance of how to average it out or, you know, over a period of time, how to average it out. Mm. So right now, with uh, prices down 50%, does that mean that prices are going to be cut on, uh, on no, the it's, MRP? It's, it's is it as simple as that? Yeah. No, it's not as simple as that because, uh, firstly, if they're down today, uh, that doesn't ensure that they're going to be down tomorrow. Uh, you're seeing high cotton prices on the MRP over a period of the last six to eight months. So depending on what happens over the next six to eight months, uh, will really determine the MRP is six to eight months down the line. Okay, so how, how often do you kind of assess the situation on the pricing front? Well, normally we don't like to change the pricing unless there's an abnormal uh, increase in uh, prices or input costs. Uh, no manufacturer or brand wants to keep you know, tinkering with the prices. It's not a commodity where you can you know, say tomorrow five rupees up and tomorrow you know, five rupees down. Mm. So somewhere it averages out. We keep it keep it stable. Uh, to some extent, we absorb it and then pass on something. So at some level, it all averages out for us. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, if you were to look right now and look ahead into this financial year, how are margins going to be? Because margins for everybody have been under pressure because of this. Well, market. they are going to be under pressure. As you've seen, all input costs are up. Uh, the markets are tough. So yes, there, there will be some pressure on margins. But uh, I think if you're a strong branded company, uh, people will move towards you first. Mm. You have an uh, interesting export uh, exposure as well. Uh, how has that been impacted by the kind of noises that we're hearing on the slowdown, on the kind of uh, uh, you know, turmoil that we're seeing in key economies right now? Well, I would say everybody's exports are impacted. I think uh, to, f to first say that the yes, exports are impacted because the main markets, the US, Europe, are not doing well. Japan's doing significantly better than expected. These are the three main markets the way I look at them. Having said that, I think uh, competition from China is its a very interesting scenario because the yarn is appreciating, so it's making uh, Chinese export a little less competitive. But on the back of that, you're seeing uh, increased input costs in uh, China and fundamentally on two issues. One is labor and one is power. Mm -hmm. So their input costs are going up, which is making them a little more uneconomical. Mm -hmm. Riding this, the third thing that's happening interestingly in China is that... Uh, People are looking inward, so there's, there is a conscious effort to build up domestic demand. 
and be less vulnerable to global cycles. Mm. So a lot of companies have started focusing inward and started selling inward. Therefore, uh, the availability of products for the international market has become less. So I think all these factors coupled together are actually holding us out that you know, where, where it is a little bit of turbulent time, but we're getting this advantage. So you're net net okay. I think. But for, from your standpoint, like China is looking inwards, um, is the domestic market going to be a concern? Because everybody is scaling down the growth of India. But you know that you know every time there is a sale in Big Bazaar, or there is any kind of an event, uh, the kind of retail rush is very high. What's the sense that you're getting on footfalls in across Raven stores, etc.? Is there a slowdown because of inflation of the slowing growth? Or do you think uh, there is traction there? Well, I think really like what I tried to explain earlier, I think branded companies will face, face less of the slowdown. I think if you're branded and say somebody bought three shirts from three different brands and, and there's a recessionary trend, he tends to move back to the strongest brand. So the, in effect, the strongest brand actually gains and the smaller brands actually lose out because he then goes safe. He, his risk-taking ability becomes less. And he says, no, I'd, I'd rather buy two trousers from Raymond, then two from Raymond and two from somebody else. I'll cut out the other two and I'll just go safe in this tough time. Mm -hmm. Number two, I think Raymond, because of its strong brand equity, has done a huge market penetration. So new markets are opening up for us, which, which was a, a very interesting experience for us. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, a, in a country where the unorganized sector is still the dominant player, won't they be uh, down trading in that sense where a lot of the uh, you know, focus will move into the unorganized, cheaper sections. I mean, is that something? Well, in the theory that you're talking about, about the the dominant brand actually benefiting, do, do numbers really stack up? With yes, that? for us to do. But you see, let me just answer your, uh, you know, unorganized sector. We don't compete in that space. Mm -hmm. We've cut off at a particular price point where the unorganized sector takes over. And that's going to be a man-eat-man -man world because they're, they're the only thing that has determined is price. In our products, we're in the market that we are in, we're not going down the market or down the pyramid like you'd say, but we're going across the country. I think we're opening up in class three, class four, class five, now class six, class seven towns. And it's really the power of the Raymond brand that's giving you success in those markets because mm. people know of your brand. People have an aspiration to buy your brand. And now you're actually classical marketing. You're taking the product to them as opposed to them having to go for the product. Certainly, if there's a win-win situation for whoever brings an alliance and for us, uh, why not look at it? From a brand strategy point of view, Raymond has uh, seen some interesting moves in the last two, two and a half, three years, maybe 2008 onwards, because you've experimented with a lot of sections, withdrawn, experimented again, and it seems as though you're churning your portfolio to figure out which are the growth areas. Have you defined your growth areas right now? Because there is a move to go towards the slightly mass, uh, massier segment with makers, for instance. You know, Th That is a segment that you had withdrawn from with Notting Hill earlier. You know, So th there is a little bit of churn happening from, from a person who's standing outside. I'm not quite understanding what your strategy is. Well, there's a continuous churn. I think the only thing in life that's constant is change. So you're continuously experimenting. We try. If we fail, we don't get deterred. We, you know, maybe try something different. Notting Hill was done with an extremely different reason. It was firstly a ready-made brand. Sure. Makers was a flanking brand strategy where uh, there's a point up to which you'll take Raymond. The product is very different. If you see Makers is more uh, polyester viscose driven, Raymond is more poly wool driven. Sure. Uh, so it's a flanker brand strategy which we can d enter different kinds of markets. And I think the launch phase uh, has been very, very encouraging. When you decide on segments, what is the strategy that's driving you? I mean, well, we have uh, a proper research. We do proper research and we see, uh, like we shut Zap. I mean, we, we launched Zap. We believed that Zap would do well, but it didn't do well. Mm -hmm. we, we shut it down. We had no issue with that. We did B. It didn't do well. So for everything that does do well, there are some things that don't do well. And, and you've got to accept that. You've got to keep trying and try and you can do as much research as you want in the boardroom, but it's when you actually go into the marketplace, you realize whether it's going to work or not. Hmm. And we, we realized very quickly that, you know, Zap was not going to work for whatever reasons. So we got out of it. Hmm. Uh, but we think the Raymond brand is extremely strong. Uh, we did an ex extension into Raymond Premium Apparel. So it's apparel under the Raymond brand. Park Avenue is doing very well. 
Color Plus is doing well, Parks is doing well. So but Manzoni was again an experiment that didn't quite work. Well, what happened well, with that brand? It, we, we took it to a particular size hmm. and we figured that it's not going to grow significantly larger than that. Human resource is limited and we then said that if you've got Raymond Premium Apparel coming into the market, there's a conflict of interest between Manzoni and Premium Apparel because what do you do between the two? Hmm. And we saw the upscalability of the Raymond brand significantly higher than upscalability of Manzoni. We'd rather back Raymond Premium Apparel which was not there seven years ago when we launched Manzoni and we can significantly improve our business. That brings us to a dichotomy that all brands have at this point, Gautam, that extensions of existing strong brands into new s categories, I mean in, in this case Raymond into the premium category versus creating a whole new brand in that premium category. What has the learning for you been like? That is it better to go with a tried and tested Raymond and push it upwards rather than create an all new entity out there? It depends what you want to do. I mean we, we figure that in Raymond we did a brand study and we believe that there's a brand extension possible in Raymond. We've identified areas where we can extend the Raymond brand. And really, in today's world, really focus on, on the power brands. Mm -hmm. Because Manzoni, even having looked at it, we figure that at best you get about 20 crores, 30 crores of sales. Is it worth the management time? Can we put similar products like that on the Raymond brand? And then if Raymond has to be the most desired brand from our portfolio, then let's put all our efforts behind that. And how can we significantly expand business on that? Number two, acceptability of the Raymond brand is already there. It's been around for 85 years. So people know it. Hmm. And, and for you to just go in there and say, okay, you know, you've got a ready-made jacket. I'm happy to buy a ready-made jacket today from Raymond because, you know, I know the brand. I trust the brand. Cost of creation of a new brand in this country is very high. You know, this brings me to my next logical question. You know, you have a good, good brand uh, with Raymond. You have a very good... Uh, outlet spread and uh, you know your footprint across the country is very high and this is the time when a lot of change is happening in the retail space because of what's happening with the FDI and retail or the expectation of FDI and retail. How do you see the landscape changing and what does it mean for players like you right now? Well I think you know people are going to come into this country whether FDI or not they've come in through different routes. If your business model is sound you are going to succeed. Raymond actually has been in retail in this country since 1959. That was when the first store opened. We have over seven, 800 stores today. The knowledge that we have in the market space, the lead that we have in the market space will certainly hold us well uh, going forward. Also, the relationships that we have in the market space is very difficult. India is a very relationship-driven country. So even if a foreigner comes here, I mean, I don't think they're ever going to be able to connect emotionally with the trade. The retail trade is a very emotional connection mm. that is required to you know connect with this trade. And in our space, so if you take retail specifically for menswear, we have a significant lead. So we're we very confident we are, we are okay for the next five years. We have no issue. Mm. So you know, I completely buy that point that you know the, the emotional connect is very important. But uh, there are different kinds of possibilities of. You know, it is also a high cost and high cash burn kind of a business, the, the more you spread out. Could there be possibilities in alliances? Where Would you be open to alliances, for instance? Honestly, I haven't thought about it because we're focused on our retail business. Uh, mm -hmm. We've not really been approached by anybody for an alliance and I really haven't studied it. So, uh, But certainly if there's a win-win situation for whoever brings an alliance and for us, uh, why not look at it? What would induce an alliance? Is it the kind of capital that would be put in place in terms of investment? Would that be an attraction? Well, frankly, today we don't need an alliance in the retail space because we're going about our business in, in the retail uh, pretty well funded and, and knowing what we're doing. But like I said, I, I haven't really thought about it as to what kind of alliance might create a win-win situation. If, uh, you know, Raymond has been in the retail space for a long time, Gautam, but to say that Indians also understand the retail space is wrong because I think from 2007 to now what we've also seen is a lot of experimentation in the retail space where a lot of Indian companies have tried new formats, not worked, pulled back and we discussed that happened with you also. So what are the learnings from that? Well, I think, you know, if you focus on what you're doing and you focus for the right reasons that, you know, we believe our business model works. If you see our project P89, which P99, which was to to expand in class four, class five towns, that was one project we got right, and I think really it expanded us into class four, class five towns in a very big way. Mm. 
we went in with the right model we gave the right value to the consumer and i think it it's it's just been a fantastic strategy for us so if you focus on the business in the giving value to the consumer i think you'll be successful if you focus on it for say market cap or raising money or any of those reasons which are the other reasons then i think you're making a mistake so what is the challenge going ahead because you know you have a year when you know as we said the margins are going to be in, under pressure you also have a year when you'll probably have a lot of competition coming in so going forward and if you were to look at this as a stepping stone for a new era or new phase of growth what would your strategy be but well, i think we have a business plan for the next 5 years on how we want to attack the market space it's really the implementation challenges today properties have uh, lots of issues in getting titles cleared etc etc so it's it's finding our business partners uh, because the growth is going to be exponential from you know as we want to move forward as you aware remind is the number one textile apparel company in the country so it's up to a point it's easy but then you know after 800 stores how do you get to the next 100 next 100 next 100 it just becomes that much more difficult so the implementation challenges will always be there but the general sense is that money is very important for this kind of role out of course you have a franchise come owned model so in that sense you know your cash burn isn't as much as most people but how much money would this kind of expansion entail well it, it doesn't take a lot of money uh, without giving you numbers it doesn't take a lot of money because we are going on the franchisee model and the reason the franchisee model works for us is because of the strong brand equity hmm. uh it's something that's held us good for the last 60 years mm. and we take care of our franchisees we are one family is the raymond family uh so people understand that there is there is a return on this business you must let the franchisee earn money and i think it's a model that we we've, we've been extremely successful over the last 6 decades mm. so moving forward is really finding the right partner and creating the right model I don't think we should get so worried with these these big guys with deep pockets coming. I think big guys with deep pockets are more liable to lose a lot more money. Well, how do you see uh, the next year of growth going to be? What are the focus areas? You've already laid out what your plans are and how the the Raymond brand is going to see extension. If you have actually looked back into the last year and seen the kind of growth because the last year had its share of problems you know uh, to be honest i think the the volatility in raw material prices the margin pressures were more evident over the last couple of quarters and it's come to a kind of a climax right now what is the lesson that you've learned in terms of growth where is the growth coming in from in which of the cities that are growing for you i think this whole p99 project that we did which is to go into class 4 class 5 towns has been a huge growth for us hmm. because we've done about 70 80 of those towns already and that's a new market which is which is really you know serve us every year year after year after year and that's seeding for the next class 6 and class 7 towns it's given us a lot of uh, encouragement that class 6 and class 7 can now be tapped mm. you got the 2011 census out now which will throw up as to what new markets might have opened up so it's really focusing on rural india i think bombay delhi calcutta chennai is okay but but india is not this this is not india when foreigners come to india they come to bombay delhi chennai calcutta bangalore and they go away and they say this is india. that's not india mm. i mean it may be 5 7 8 percent of india but eventually india is is the hinterland and that's where the demand is that's what's driving this economy and that brings me to the last question you know when you spoke about fdi and retail got there was a time when everybody was very worried about that about the big guys coming and you know wiping out the kirana guys and all of that they came but the kirana guys are still there and now the new wave will come Are you saying that by the time FDI and retail happens and the retailers, international retailers come in, you will have found new new markets deeper in inside India? Why is why is international better? They have money. They have deep pockets. It's not about money. If I give you five thousand crores today, can you create a Raymond brand? You can't do it. What's the bottom line? I'm not trying to sound arrogant, but you can't do it. Raymond is not built on money. It's built on relationships. It's built on quality. It's built on trust. and that takes time but you have the biggest format stores internationally which have gone into new markets and done i don't think we should get so worried with these these big guys with deep pockets coming i think big guys with deep pockets are more liable to lose a lot more money if we don't have the money we're not going to lose it we're a little more careful is that also an understanding that you have reached after the 3 years or 4 years of brand experimentation that you can't create another raymond 
and it's best to extend and expand within the the umbrella of Raymond. Is that no, something? I mean, something? I think I, I take it in the right spirit that I said. I said today, if you actually go down, what is what is? I believe a brand is built over a period of time. It cannot be built overnight. And if you take a brand like ours today, you see a lot of people say that my father recommended it to me. Now, when you if you take a zero date, say today I start advertising for a brand. It'll take at least a couple of years before somebody notices it and says, let me go try the product. Then he goes and buys a product once. Then he buys it a second time. Then he buys it a third time. Then he goes back and says, oh God, this product lasts me for five years and seven years and 10 years. By the time 15 years are gone. Then he recommends it and then it starts becoming a brand in his mind. It doesn't become overnight. Hmm. Number two, your trade relationships. We were in, in Macau for a conference. We've had, I had four people four generations of the same family there. There was a son, his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather. All four of them were at the conference. Now that trade relationship is so important to us that you can't build it for money. You know, rarely have I seen you sit across the table and actually talk about what your vision for Raymond is. And I think that that was a very interesting opportunity in, in this kind of an interview. So let me ask you that, given all of it, given the learnings, given the kind of opportunities that you're seeing, given the huge potential that you have going forward, how do you envisage Raymond five years down the line? Well, as the number one textile apparel solution, uh, I think we will be going into the hinterland, more stores, better products, uh, focused in the three or four brands that we have, and really giving our consumer, you know, consumer delight uh, in terms of the best products. We already make the best products in the world, so we're very, very proud of that. Uh, we're the only company in the world that makes Super 240. So I think really changing the notion of people that if it's imported, it's better. Uh, I think the best products are made in this country. Mm. And I, just to give you an example, we talk about, you know, India not making great suits. We, we sell suits to Japan last seven years, every single day, 500 suits a day. Now they say the Japanese sleep in their suits and if, they, if our suits are good for the Japanese, which are the most quality conscious market, not the US, not Europe, I think we're probably making the best products in the world. On that note, thank you so much. Thank Mark. you very much. Thank you.